Good morning, everyone. I think I will give our panelists uh, two minutes each for the introduction to tell us who they are, what they do, and uh, the organizations they serve, and possibly anything that could be relevant for this panel. Welcome, and I will start with the find, the Alma, kindly. Hi, um, good, this is still morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, very delighted to be here. I, I heard the, the um, then you, you were struggling with my same name, it's Hanaka. Yes. <laughs> so um, I'm from South Africa, so that's South African same name. Um, I'm with uh, Equity Bank, it's about eight months now. I'm new in the country, I'm no longer new, it's eight, mo eight months now in the country. So I'm looking forward to our discussions today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kafudia Wariuke. I lead the cybersecurity team at KCB Group. A very exciting team of cybersecurity experts where we um, give the direction on cybersecurity matters for KCB Group. I am a thought leader in the areas of cybersecurity, uh, risk management, and especially security awareness for children. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amenyo Luchu from ARB Apex Bank, Ghana. I'm the CISO responsible for implementing the strategy of information security, governance, risk, compliance for the bank and uh, supporting the rural banks in Ghana. And I'm glad to be here, thanks. Welcome, uh, my name is Cyrus Kamau, as introduced. I'm the CIO at uh, NACOSTI, in short, it's the National Commission for Science, Technology and Innovation. We are the regulator of the STNI sector, and I also serve within the African Union uh, Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy 2024 as a reviewer. I also work with other agencies and other parts of, of my work funding. So to this morning, we are, we are glad to have um, it is the financial sector, which is a key player and an enabler within the environment. And as we look at the aspect of cybersecurity, we are interested to know quite a number of issues that would come up, including cybersecurity and how they are able to address it. To start us off, we'll start with uh, our CISO from KCB, uh, Mr. Kavudia Ryunge. This is to do with the aspect of training. And we would want to ask in, in terms of the emergence of uh, cyber security threats. Remember from 2019, the, the COVID uh, coming in and staff working from home, there was a lot of aspect of remote uh, connectivity and, uh, and use of technology from home. So I don't know what experiences and how he was able to handle that. Maybe from his experiences, he can be able to share for us in terms of capacity building of staff and moving into the aspect of remote working and looking at the aspect of cyber threats that were in the space and how they were able to be addressed. Kabudia, kind of. Thank you very much, Cyrus. Um, and you, you, you raise a very interesting point because traditional security was set up in such a way that our security stack <clears throat> for most organizations, uh, I'm not speaking specifically for KCB Bank, but for most organizations, our security stack is at the perimeter. That's why we put our firewalls, our IPS, and all these other fancy security uh, technology to, to control who comes in and who goes out. Um, and what happened at COVID, all, all of us know we suddenly had to go and uh, work from home. Our staff suddenly uh, were working remotely. The traditional model was, was premised on the fact that if somebody is inside the environment, then they are trusted. Um, they have had physical uh, access, there they, they are physical control, physical access controls to the, to the office. So if somebody is in the office, um, then they, they, there's a certain level of, 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 of trust that, that you give on, uh, to them. If they are using a, a company issued device, you know, you have your network admission control, you trust them. They get into the network, they have access to everywhere, north, south, east, west, they can tra tra traverse the network. Then COVID happened. Uh, our crown jewels, our data, was no longer uh, secured behind a perimeter because our staff were working everywhere. Um, suddenly, 
staff are con connecting to for banking and especially to to um, financial systems that can transfer large sums of money the, the kinds that that Catherine was talking about um, that, that is transferred digitally every day um, people are connecting to these systems uh, remotely and as we all know in cyber security there is what we call the eighth layer of, of, of cyber security which is the human um, we we can secure all the other the other layers, the seven layers, quite easily using technology. But the eighth layer has always been the issue, and we we, we remember what Anna uh, of No Before was presenting about security awareness. For a long time, has been a compliance issue. It is something um, for most that we tick a box. Security awareness is done once a year. There's a compulsory course for most for most organizations. There's a compulsory course that uh, people do every year, and, and new joiners are taken through some course to understand their their their, their expectations uh, uh, as as far as cybersecurity is concerned. Um, and but but the 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 the, the goal really. For, for security awareness should be behavior change. And doing a security awareness campaign or, or training once a year is not going to change behavior. Uh, like Anna was saying, we need to be able to, 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 to motivate um, our users, our staff to, to change their behavior, to, to do certain things, to do the behavior that we desire them to do. We need to make technology and especially security easy to use. That's where ability comes in. So there was, there was motivation, there was ability, and there was prompt. Uh, so we, as far as um, the, the issue of COVID is concerned, um, what we did is we, we um, implemented very quickly uh, technical controls, uh, people connecting remotely using secure, secure um, technology such as, such as VPN, and then we um, implemented multi-factor authentication, and we are very quickly uh, in the process of implementing zero trust, where since the perimeter, the, the traditional perimeter has changed, you, we cannot continue trusting users or entities just because they are having access to the network. We, we are adopting a zero trust um, um, approach to access where we do not trust anyone and we verify continuously. So today, you are connected to a network um, from, from KICC, you have a certain level of trust, which is lower than if you are connecting to the network if, when you are in the office. And, and if we see that you are connecting from the network when you are at KICC and concurrently connecting to the network when you are at home, then we ask ourselves, how can this be possible? How can you be in two places at the same time? And that increases your, your, your level of risk and, and therefore you have less access or, or limited access to resources. So I, I, I think um, COVID, for most um, has, has leapfrogged uh, cybersecurity. The issues of SASE and adoption of SASE, the adoption of zero trust, which had been predicted by Gartner uh, to, to, to take about four years, five years to, to, to be implemented, is quickly being implemented because the, the security perimeter has changed. Cyrus. Thank you, thank you, Ryunge. Uh, I think the other thing that comes into play once we are able to deal with the first challenge, which is people, we say the cyberspace is run by three key aspects. There is a people, there is a process, and there is technology. For people, it's well done. It has been addressed possibly by training. For the aspects of um, dealing with processes, we have policies in place. We have uh, manuals, procedures at work into Place. I think the biggest change that comes in is merging the third place, which is technology, whether it's in cloud or on-premise. Maybe this goes to Thelma to help us out. In terms of uh, technology, how do you bring in this into three and ensure that the people, the process, and technology in the cyberspace is able to be addressed in your work environment? Okay, so what you've just said is very fundamental. Uh, primarily because if you're going to have the best world or best in class technology without the resources to operate that or use it, let alone an effective process, then it means nothing. And I think at the core of it is really for you to understand what, what control is it that we are trying to execute with that technology. Um, 
you know, you need to understand, uh, you know, which resources are supposed to be executing that control or who are the users that are supposed to be using that control and whether the process is either automated or manual, they have to be working. And at the core of it as well is understanding the business need for that particular control as well as your threat exposure. Because there's no point in you going to buy the best in class technology um, that is not fit for purpose for your organization or that your organization is not even ready for it. If I can just give an example where you go and buy the best so a solution out there, there's a lot that you need to take into consideration. It can be the best technology out there, but then if you have not mapped out your incident response processes before you automate it, if you don't even have other working tools that you need to orchestrate and automate, so it's as good as nothing having that type of technology. So it's very, very key that you understand your business need and the readiness of your organization to be able to go and buy this. My rate of best-in-class technologies, I mean, I've been in the industry for 19 years, so I've seen through the different types of technologies. They are there, they are great. But if you don't have those three combined, I mean, it's not a fallacy, it's true. If you don't have your people, process, and technology, your technology is as good as not even being there. Thank you. Um, as we go to, to the fourth question, and uh, I want my friend Amenyo maybe to address this, they're discussing the other aspects of patching and uh, security. And uh, knowing that cyber is one of the areas that you want to put the first line of defense, how have you come up maybe within the ecosystem in Ghana that we can learn here in terms of applying uh, the first line of defense and uh, the aspect of how frequent and how often should you be able to in do the patches and uh, do updates in that type of security. Thank you, Cyrus. I believe we are all used to the saying that prevention is better than cure. And um, with cybersecurity, with so many vulnerabilities identified on um, maybe per second or microsecond basis, uh, we need to have the habit of constant patching. And with that, policy, or driving, using policy to drive it helps us to ensure that we adhere to these principles of constantly preventing or being proactive when it comes to mitigating any threat actors. So initially start with policy, a policy whereby on a monthly basis um, you are required to patch your critical to any systems which are used in the organization. Um, some of us wait until there's a zero day or maybe uh, an operating system or application has reached its end of life before we decide to change the operating system or upgrade. But then we should make a conscious effort to patch on a continuous basis. Um, most of us use Microsoft and we are used to the um, the Patch Tuesday, where we have constant updates of security updates, and some don't necessarily even patch until they are informed that there's this threat lurking in the environment that they need to patch. Policy, because when you have policy driving that, um, management would constantly be seeking for reports on these things, and um, you would have to adhere to that. We don't only depend on compliance requirements to meet these things, but then being proactive helps us to prevent a lot of these things from affecting us. Um, if you're embarking on a journey and then with all our um, cars now, you have on the dashboard that you don't have that much fuel in your car, you'd obviously go to the gas station and fill up your tank. That is a preventive measure so that you don't run halfway through the journey and then uh, realize that you need to top up your fuel. But then constantly doing this on a regular basis, make it a habit, um, being proactive, helps us to mitigate any threat that we'll be exposed to. So policy driven, continuous patching and awareness on this so that we inform our employees, our staff, our colleagues that even if you hear anything that um, has been informed or that has 
come into the ITC um, environment that you need to patch, then you patch that. Thank you, Retsu. Uh, that's, that's a great uh, discussion uh, in terms of how we go and how we move to the future. So in the issue of this, uh, the digital future in terms of reference to organizational excellence, I want to give each one of you a two minutes parting shot to tell us how do you view your current status in terms of cyber awareness and possibly how do you see your face in the next two to five years in terms of adopting technologies that are coming and being uh, cyber ready. Uh, maybe starting from my friend Thelma. Okay. Um, allow me to go first. So I'll, I'll, I'll again go back to COVID and SASE. Um, the perimeter has changed, our security perimeter has changed, um, the perimeter is now at the end point. That is where we must secure our data, our systems, our users. Um, we cannot continue um, implementing security technology in the traditional way. Um, so zero trust again because we cannot, since, since the perimeter has changed, since our users are out there, since our data is out there, then that is where we must go. That is where we must go to secure it. So as, as cybersecurity professionals, we must change our thinking process um, and design and architecting uh, cybersecurity uh, technology to go with, 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 with the future. We, we, we need to look at um, moving security to the cloud so that cloud, uh, security is cloud native. I don't know how much time um, I, and I, well, le let me say this, because I know how much time we have spent traditionally managing appliances. So we, with cloud-delivered security solutions, we don't spend time at all managing appliances. Think about whatever it is, whether it's your EDR, it's your APP, it's your um, firewalling and all this, this uh, DDoS, WAF. We tra traditionally have always had appliances somewhere and we are managing them. We have an antivirus master server and it has slave servers and they are pushing poly, uh, updates and, 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 and all these things. But with cloud delivered uh, security um, in, the, in the realm of SASE and zero trust, we do not have to do any of that. So the future is cloud. Some people claim it's not the future, it's, 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 it's today, but in banking, we are yet to move our production environments or production workloads. At least most banks in, this, in Kenya are yet to move their production workloads to, to the cloud because of many reasons. The future is cloud. So the, the, as, as, as workloads move towards the cloud, cybersecurity must be there first so that when the works, workloads come to the cloud, they will find us there, they will find us ready, Cyrus. Thank you. Okay, just um, adding on to what you just said, uh, as security professionals, we, pr we give our users the technical safeguards. But at the end of the day, it's also our users helping us to make sure that we secure our environments and secure our, our you know, uh, what we do with the, within our organizations. If I can give you an example, um, this basic example, when you've got your house, in your house, you've got the doors, you've got the windows, you've got the keys to your door. Um, those things are the technical safeguards that are there. But if you forget to close your door, or you give away your key, or you actually don't close your windows, can you really blame security? So it's really, really about how we also firm up on our messaging to our users out there. Like Anna was mentioning earlier on, there's various ways that we can make sure that we lend the message to our users accordingly. And also, it's not only the users. If you look on the customer side as well, a lot of the times, uh, social engineering is very, very big um, among our customers. And then uh, we need to be able to firm up our messaging and awareness to our customers as well, because we have the technical safeguards. But then if the customer is going to be social engineered to give away their credentials, to give away whatever information, you can not necessarily blame security and say security does not work because our platforms, our tools will tell you that, okay, I've authenticated that is you, that if they were able to somehow bypass that whole process, um, it becomes something else. 
So, yeah, so that's really where I'm seeing that we can even place a lot more focus in that area. Thank you. All right, I'll go for security by design. More often than not, um, security is an afterthought. So you have the um, finance department or the marketing department coming up with a new product. And after the development of the product, all the use cases have been developed. Then they call in the security team or come and do a vulnerability assessment of the product. And you come in and you identify so many vulnerabilities. It causes delays in the project. So it gets to a point where it's identified in quotes that the security team always delays pro projects, so sometimes they just sidestep you so that they can go to market early enough because uh, stakeholders uh, want to generate more income. But when you implement security by design or you adopt a security by design approach, everybody comes on board from day one. So you can identify all the possible security lapses that would be in that product, and then it doesn't tend to delay the rollout of any projects. So many organizations have embarked on digital transformation efforts. Um, my good friend talked about COVID, where they had to deploy so many um, solutions on the fly. But then, did we consider security by design? Did we think of security before even embarking on those projects, or as we were embarking on those projects. We have several banks doing internet banking, SMS banking, and these are already solutions on the market, but did we do all the risk assessment? So if we create this um, together with a cybersecurity culture in our organization, I believe we would reduce these constant incidents and reportage um, security or cyber security events globally and more specifically in our institutions. Thank you, Rotsu. Um, my parting shot in this is that uh, from my experience is that cyber attacks and cyber challenges will always come. So the question is whether, is not whether they will come, the question is when they occur. Are you ready? So aspects of putting into place mechanisms and systems for business continuity planning, data recovery, and all as aspects are set into place, such that if they occur, then you're able to say you are cyber resilience, in that you are able to recover within the shortest time possible, and possible you're able to move your entire organization on to back to production to the level to which it was before the cyber attack happened. And that one has helped me prepare and create systems into place in terms of business continuity planning. Looking at the aspects of cyber resilience rather than thinking on a one way through on how all aspects will come in. But to the contributions of all my panelists here, I want to thank you for your time. I would want to give one or two questions for, from the, from the uh, plenary in case they are there and maybe before we lock out for the closure. So. Yeah, uh, I hope I can get somebody to help me move the mic. Uh, can I have the hands up so that I'm able to count and I'm able to see? I can see two from where I'm seated. Three. Um, do we have the microphone? Let's take as few questions as possible. Yeah, three. Uh, I think I can three. see three so hands. How, how many? Uh, I can see three hands. I think those are enough. We One, can take the three. Two, we'll record. Three. At right. the middle. Michael. Then you will close. For any, then you can meet uh, possibly later. All right, thank you. Uh, here first. Of course, say your name also. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Martin Koyabe uh, from the AUGFCE project. I'll talk tomorrow. But the question that I wanted to ask the panel is what are the contingency plans that are being put in place regarding ransomware? Because you are in an institution, banking is very sensitive. And we know that if you have a ransomware in your infrastructure and the person is claiming and they want money, uh, what are the contingency plans that you have in your institutions? And if you have any, what are the experiences that you want to share with other institutions on what actions to take? Thank you. I would wish that we take the three questions, then the panelists will answer all of them so that all we right, can try. 
Hi, my name is Valentine. I'm the Africa lead for IT and network security at Audit at Airtel Africa. I have more than one question. And the first one is um, from a CISO perspective, you have compliance requirements, you have regulatory requirements, you have certification requirements. And most of the time, you're required to tick a box. But there are projects that you have in mind that you know would improve security. And I think we all know that even if you're compliant 100%, you can still be compromised. So from a resourcing perspective and from your own perspective, how do you ensure that you also have your projects in place to improve cybersecurity? Second question is a lot of people are working from home now. And I know you've talked about putting security on the cloud. But there is the challenge of where a lot of the systems only update when a user is in the office. For instance, AV. For instance, the patches, right? So how are you approaching this challenge to ensure that even with working from home, you're still up to date in terms of security? Last question. Um, you've also talked about the people and the processes. But there are issues that cannot be resolved by tools, especially if you're dealing with customers at the very lower level. There are issues where, um, say, it can be bypassed. A person just needs basic education. They need to have gone to secondary school and they can social engineer our customers. From a CISO perspective, again, I know tools are important. But when it comes to fixing these issues that cause reputational issues for your firm, what is the approach on this? Thank you. Uh, the other question, Mr. Saras? I'm seeing two hands. Which one? All right, thank you. Kindly keep it short so that uh, the answers are straightforward if you can. Thank you. Sure, thank you. My name is Kenneth Kamau. And, uh, the previous speakers talked about uh, the need to create uh, cyber diplomacy and also create uh, cyber guards among uh, the youths in Africa. But then again, uh, I'd like to know how are you going about creating cyber ambassadors on the context of uh, the local community so as to protect yourselves from uh, cyber attacks? Thank you. Thank you. I think the question is one on cyber around somewhere, there is an issue of uh, processes and uh, people within the lower levels in terms of people process and technology, uh, you can decide to pick either and possibly answer. Okay, I will, I'll, I'll take, I'll start with the ransomware question. Um, so we've had ransomware situations in the past and I think the lessons learned has been that uh, first and foremost, the organization, you must have a policy on ransomware, you know, do you pay, do you not pay as an organization? And of course, you need to make sure that you have an incident response process around that. You need to have a ransomware playbooks that will guide the different scenarios and you need to play them out regularly so that your CSET team and all your stakeholders understand what is their role in situations when situations like that happen. And you need to make sure that you back up so in one, instance, in one instance, many years ago, in one of the organizations I was with, um, we had a ransomware and they encrypted a very, very critical file. Um, and uh, at that time, you know, when you do backups at the end of the day, uh, you find that, I mean, the criticality of how of that file, you, we couldn't go back and trace back. A lot has happened on that day, which then forced us to make sure that we did backups every 30 minutes. Um, so that you can, you, you're, if at any given time, you are able to get your data uh, if the such scenarios happen. Playbooks, very, very important, um, and you need to play them out so that everybody knows what they need to do. And then if I can just address also, uh, you mentioned a question around compliance and how do you balance compliance with your projects and what you need to do. A lot of the times we know in our world compliance, compliance is second nature, it, it comes. So it can be the driver of us running security. Um, you know, we, you, you need to have a proper, proper strategy, which I'm going to talk about later in the afternoon. 
you need to understand what is your security appetite and what is the tone at the top for your security organization. And you need to map out your security program. And within your program, you need to make sure that you understand your compliance universe and make sure that within your program, while you're executing your projects, you are able to also make sure that you, you are able to comply with all the requirements or regulations that affect your business. Okay. Thank you, Thelma. Uh, the question on program projects, who will pick uh, on uh, addressing the, the people within various levels for program and projects? Um, if I understood the question correctly, um, it, it speaks to, if I understood the question correctly, it speaks to the fact that some of the solutions we design are designed with Nairobi in mind, with a Nairobian in mind. So we are talking about somebody who's using the latest mobile phone, iPhone, Samsung. Uh, it has patches, uh, but more often than not, we forget the person, our customers who are using feature phones, who are instead of using mobile apps, they are using USSD, for example. Um, I, I can probably speak generally and say through KBA, um, KBA has been running, so the banks through KBA have been running uh, what is called catch on your campaign that educates users, bank users, on security around pins. Uh, these are pins that they use for ATMs or pins that they use for, for banking uh, so that they understand that uh, pin yako siriako. Your pin is your secret. You should not share it with anybody. If you go to an ATM machine and people are, are, are want to help you to do something, then you should not, you should not allow uh, these people. But more fundamentally, it is more, it is about um, making security easy. Now I go back to behavior model. It is a, 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 an area, it is a topic I'm very interested in. It's my research topic about um, the human aspects of cybersecurity. What makes people do what they do? What makes us continue using poor passwords? Um, yet we know. And if you recall from the presentation again, just because people know doesn't mean they care. Just because security awareness uh, where you are giving information doesn't necessarily change behavior. So one of the things to ensure that uh, cybersecurity is followed, even by the list of, of, of the users as it were, is to make cybersecurity easy. It's to make it easy for them to be able to use products and services securely. Thank you. And finally, it was on science. <coughs> it was on uh, cybersecurity diplomacy, which Dr. Gitao addressed. How do you remain resilient? A lot, so, in terms of that. Okay, in terms of cybersecurity diplomacy, well, we have a lot of uh, government regulation to do with cybersecurity, and um, most of these are also tailored towards organizations or industries' verticals and. The industry or the business has a big role to play when it comes to cyber di diplomacy because industries are responsible for developments in countries. So we need to make inputs into creating or coming up with these cyber security acts and legal instruments. And with that, we would ensure that the business environment is safe. And if the business environment is safe, the country obviously would be a safer place for economies to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Lotsu. Thank you, panelists. Kindly appreciate the panelists for their time. And I wish you all, thank you all for your time and for your all right. contributions. Asana. Thank you. Mr. Cyrus. <laughs> appreciate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Thank you so much. Asante sana. Uh -huh. That is a menu. Asante sana. Moderator Cyrus Kamau. He has done a great job indeed. Thank you so much, Praveen. Thank you so much, Sarah. A day to remember.